Welcome to Media Gito, and a very warm welcome to new subscribers. Leave me a comment. Tell me how you got here. Which video of mine caused you to, inspired you to click the big button that said, all right, all right, I'm on board. Now, I've talked about this several times before, but there are very few voices out there that you can trust or that you want to hear more from. You know, half of these YouTube videos that I click on, whether it's about Serena Williams, now understand, gentlemen, that even though I may not make a video about Serena Williams' outburst and what an idiot she is, or Nike and Colin Kaepernick, that I am very much consuming these issues. I am very much interested in them. And perhaps I'll comment on them. I don't know. I mean, you know how this show goes. Um, I'll start off. I mean, this video will be about Elliot Smith. It'll be me reading from Torment Sane as well as commenting as I go along. But interjections uh, and digressions and whatever are all part of it. All to say that I am aware of the culture. And maybe there's your things for the uncultured show, I don't know. Certain issues like Serena Williams' outburst, um, you know. What was the other one? Me to G-Tow, you fucking stoner. Okay? You can always pause, dude. This is not a good start for you, my friend. All right? Serena Williams' outburst, as well as the Colin Kaepernick Nike controversy. I guess I'll just touch on them briefly. I have nothing else to say about Serena Williams except that she's an entitled brat who used her gender uh, in order to verbally abuse the umpire of this match. <clears throat> and the crowd cheered her disgustingly. And, you know, she kind of got her way, I think. I don't, I don't know. Did, did, did the other girl win? <laughs> Why am I so scared? Why are you so scared to talk about tennis media? Yeah. Okay. He's killed in there. All right. So... This display of hers was disgusting, unprofessional, yet she's out there fighting for women's rights, you guys. Serena Williams is out there fighting for women. See, I thought she was just swinging a fucking racket and hitting the ball and running around. No, 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 no. She's fighting for women, you guys. All that, you see how she ran over there? She was fighting for a woman. And then when she ran over to the other side of the tennis court... She was fighting for another woman. And when she hits the ball, she's fighting for a woman. And then when she hits the ball again, she is fighting for a woman. So Serena Williams is a national hero. Serena Williams is a national hero on 9-11. Okay. Um, just in case you didn't pick up on my dripping sarcasm, I do not feel that way. Um, before I talk about, <clears throat> why, why can't I remember Colin Kaepernick and Nike? <laughs> it's just because these issues are so obvious. I, why am I even, I want to say today is September 11th, 2018 and it is Patriots day, I think. And we live, you know, if you're an international listener, you're very welcome to listen to this show. I encourage you to, and thank you for listening. I'm an American. I don't say that um, with arrogance, I hope. No, I'm just stating a fact. You have to understand that the left has gotten so into our minds that even stating that you're American, that you're proud to be an American, is seen as some kind of act of fucking domestic terrorism. Right? We're supposed, I'm supposed to be ashamed of my country. I'm supposed to be ashamed to live here um, in this horrible Trump land of deporting people and DACA, keeping immigrants from their children. And, uh, yeah, I'm supposed to be ashamed to live in the United States of America. I'm not even going to go on with what I was going to say. I mean, it's laughable. You know, when South Park or whatever <clears throat> says something like, if you don't like it, you can just get out. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, it's like It's a major cliche at this point, but, yeah, you know. I don't understand people who live in the United States of America and continue to trash on the United States of America. Are we a perfect country? No. We were never a perfect country. 
We do things, and I'm not going to get into it because, frankly, I'm uninformed on a lot of these issues. Now, Team America World Police, sure, I mean, okay. There is a reason that the United States is the greatest superpower in the world. Now, I don't say superpower in a fucking Marvel kind of way. I'm saying the obvious, which is economically. I'm sure there's China, Russia, whatever. Okay. The United States has done some evil to gain its power. That is indisputable. Um, I think it's kind of how one becomes powerful. <clears throat> Which reminds me, you know, second season of Ozark and how much of a disappointment that ended up being. So when we say if you don't like it, meaning this country, you can just get out. Um, yeah, that's true. Now, I, am I saying you must blindly follow legislation and anything the president says? No. No. But have you ever gone to another country? Have you ever been anywhere where you didn't have human rights? Have you ever seen true poverty and starvation? I didn't fucking think so. So before you start talking about how you had to wait too long in the welfare line to get your $400 for the week and what a piece of shit country it is, why don't you take a little travel to anywhere else that's not the Western world? And, you know, just see how they rape you and fucking murder you. So, happy 9-11... I don't say that facetiously. Because when we say never forget, we, th we mean exactly that. <clears throat> well, never forget what, Media Gito? Never forget how vulnerable we allowed ourselves to be. Now, also never forget that our own government, excuse me, our own government allowed it to happen via inaction, via ignorance. And also, I mean, you can go back to the connections with Bin Laden and the Saudis. Uh, Saudis? No. See, this is where I conflate things, you guys. And I don't feel bad about it. But you can go back to the connections between the Bushes and Bin Laden since the 80s. And how we armed him and his people. Anyway, we dug our own hole. Did 9-11, was 9-11 an inside job, you guys? Absolutely fucking not. And this is where your tinfoil hat is showing. 9-11 was not an inside job. No, I do not think that we intentionally killed 3,000 plus of our own citizens. No, I do not think that. I think that Bush and Dick Cheney allowed it to happen by ignoring important intelligence in regards to an imminent attack, and that's a quote, from bin laden we you know they received intelligence in the summer of 2001 now what would they have done there's plenty they could have done you guys okay these guys got the terrorists of 9/11 got box cutters onto a plane due to a lack of screening by tsa agents which i don't even believe the tsa the transportation safety administration existed it was created because of this catastrophe, this tragedy that was September 11, 2001. So we allowed it to happen via incompetence, ignorance, inaction, and, and there's plenty more things that they could have done at the airport level on that morning 17 years ago. It is important for us to commemorate this time. Obviously, this is a video about Elliot Smith. It is also a national day of mourning. Um, this will be, you know, at, at a certain point, there may be another terrorist attack that is of greater impact or kills more people. And obviously that'd be terrible. But for now, this is our Pearl Harbor and it's, it will be commemorated every year, whether you like it or not. And some of you are going to go try to forget. Um, well, when we say never forget, you know, we're also just speaking about honoring those who died. I think about all the time 
What a terrifying and awful experience that would have been to have died in the manner in which these, at least the people on the planes, and now, of course, there are many people, hundreds, thousands of people in the two towers that perished. I often think about having been on one of those planes and headed straight for that tower and the kind of fear, and, and we can hear the phone calls, of course. It is a terrible, terrible way to die. And this is something that happened because of inaction, because of American incompetence, and also because of the evil of Osama bin Laden and his team. Now, every ideology, as I've discussed before, has its own sense of desire for good and God and 87 virgins. Okay, no, I don't know, you guys. I'm not getting into the specifics of... I know I always say that. The specifics. I've heard myself say it on like several videos. What a douche media G Tao is. I'm not going to get into the religion and the ethos, um, the mentality of the attack from Bin Laden's perspective because I just don't understand it. I could do the academic research. Uh, you know, the basic understanding is, oh, they hate America. They hate freedom. No, no, this is retribution. This was a long time coming. But if you want to know more about it, watch some documentaries. So maybe I should not say happy 9-11. I should just say we remember. And there's been a lot that's happened since then, but we live on. We've lived on through several presidents. And a lot of you left fuckers are, well, you wouldn't be on my channel anyway, okay? So I'm sorry, I'm not speaking to you, but a lot of the left would say we're in the worst time in American history right now. Well, I would say that was 17 years ago and the events that unfolded um, for a couple years after. But I'm not going to get into the Iraq war. So let's just take a second and remember the victims of September 11, 2001. Okay, so we're going to be reading, I'm going to be reading from Torment Saint. Um, yeah, sorry, my mind, <laughs> I'm just wondering if I had anything else to say. Yeah, I was going to talk about Nike and Kaepernick. I'm not going to do it now. 9-11 is way more important, obviously. And we'll just end that particular commentary there. I'll talk about Colin Kaepernick and Nike and their, well, what El Gordo calls their brilliant strategy. Um... As far as making Colin the face and voice and basically emblem of Nike, I'll talk about that on another video because I'm not even going to disrespect the tragedy that was 9-11 with the fucking tragedy that is Colin Kaepernick. So we're back to Torment Saint, um, the life of Elliot Smith. Now... Jumping in is a little weird. So right now, Elliot Smith is forming Heat Miser in the late 80s with his friends uh, Brant Peterson as well as Neil Gust. And there might be one other guy in here. So I'm going to jump in, and it'll be a little awkward, and you'll be like, what the fuck's going on? But then we'll be rocking in Portland. So we're starting, uh, it says he, this is a description of Brant Peterson, who's the bassist in what would become Heat Miser. He joined up with Red Vines in the fall of 1989, playing jangly rock, a kind of country punk. They gigged at Blue Gallery and Satyricon, Teddy Miller on drums, Rob McNulty of St. Pilgrim singing. Rehearsals were held in a warehouse around Northwest Davis Street. You could not smoke, the place was a fire trap, so everyone chewed tobacco Largely because of his drinking and the depression it softened, Peterson, as he says, shit the nest in that band. I made it stop being fun. I just had this overweening anxiety for the bass to be loud enough. There was ongoing internal confusion, Peterson feels, looking back. In his view, playing in a band equaled being in a family. 
The prospect of playing for more than one band at a time, the sort of thing lots of players managed, was unthinkable. I felt like every band I was in had to crystallize my identity totally. I felt like this is the place I'll be safe and where I'll be valued. A brief flirtation with Sprinkler followed. Peterson says he suggested the name. But he wound up in M99, a band Elliot knew and saw, as did everyone. They were a punk version of a bar band. The idea then for Brandt was to play every weekend and drink a lot. Heidi Hellbender sang, with James Mahone from Gresham on drums. He could make rock tunes feel like swing. M99 brought out a 7-inch through Tim Kerr Records. Seizure was side A, Black Eye side B. Peterson played only on Black Eye, for a reason he was growing sadly accustomed to. There was a blowout in Vancouver. Brandt made the innocent mistake of talking to an interviewer. Guitarist Rob Landall objected, and there was an altercation with pushing and shoving. Peterson is six foot two, an imposingly fit man. When he lost it, people paid attention. They also feared getting beat up. So M99 was over for Brandt. They later brought out two albums, Too Cool for Satan and Medicine. The day Brandt met Elliot, he told him, bluntly and in clear attunement to his history of conflict, You don't want me in your band. It just gets fucked up. Everyone hates me and I get kicked out. But Elliot answered, That won't happen this time. And with that simple rejoinder, the star search was over. Elliot and Neil would sing and write songs, Lash would drum, and Brant would handle the bass. The name? Heat Miser. Yet another single word slap in the face, this one with a twist. Fictional demon Heat Miser had appeared in Rankin Bass's stop motion animated Christmas special, The Year Without a Santa Claus, 1974. He's described as a vaguely ogre like being, a blustery, quick tempered hothead. His head's exactly that hot, orange, red hair aflame, with a bulbous red nose in the center of his fat, angry face. He eats fire. He never wants to know a day that's under 60 degrees. Everything he touches melts in his clutches. He's Mr. Green Christmas. He's Mr. Sun, goes the song. No friend of Santa's, no friend of snow, no friend of cozy yuletide spirit, but a decent band name all the same, one part meaningful, one part random. Songwriting was never an issue, Elliot's fecundity already semi-legendary. Like Chicago's Urge Overkill, Heat Miser was a two-pronged singer-songwriter setup. Neil and Elliot lived together in Southwest, and they'd sit around a lot and play guitar together and arrange together. The basic ideas were individual inventions but stylistically, they'd blend together. Early on, rehearsal space was an issue. But Brant knew Jason Mitchell, whom he introduced to Elliot. Mitchell was living with Myra Dugan, Trailer Queen's drummer. Before they took it over, the house, at 210 Northeast Morris, was rented by Bikini Kill's Kathleen Hanna and various members of Calamity Jane, Directly across the street, there were occasional gang-related shootings, eventually prompting Mitchell to move. Heatmiser first practiced and rehearsed in this home's basement, meeting once or twice per week. Slowly, Mitchell and Elliot got close. They palled around, went to shows, dive bars like the Space Room, in orbit since 1959, Club 21 on Sandy Boulevard, My Father's Place, and Patty's Retreat on Southwest Stark, a Mix of bad drag queens, rock and roll kids, transients. Mitchell's tacit unofficial job was shoulder to cry on. I was sort of the band's psychiatrist, he says. They didn't always go to one another with their problems. They went instead to him. Mitchell and Gust also bonded. Neil was actually my closest friend during most of these years. The two eventually wound up living together. Neil, says Mitchell, was hilarious, fun, very driven, talented. Alrighty, so I just paused, it took a short break. So right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing kind of the grunt work of Heat Miser. We're doing the 
You know how every freaking biography begins with uh, Joe's childhood and it's boring and you have to read about what Joe's mother and father did for a living and they brought Joe up and the things Joe liked and it's fucking boring and you just want to get to when Joe got his first guitar at 13 years old. I might as well be talking about Joe Perry, whose biography I did listen to. (coughs) Point being, you got to get there. So right now we're talking about the development of Heat Miser and how everyone's real nice and getting along and shit. Let's get back to reading. It was at first a democratic process. Neil and Elliot brought songs to the band and ideas got floated, arrangements tweaked. It was very collaborative, Peterson says. More or less built that way. One guy came with a tune, partly finished or not at all. Guitar parts working together in complex ways, but not busy. It was like, this is what I'm working on. What do you think? Somehow, astonishingly to Peterson, the tunes came together fast. Most were 4-4. Peterson wrote a little, too. One of his tunes, Glamourine, a bass line with lyrics, was recorded but never put out. Elliot, Brand says, didn't want to sing lyrics other people had written. Just a Little Prick was another Peterson song on which his E string was tuned to D. That song eventually appeared, as did Elliot's Mightier Than You, on Heat Miser's first cassette, in a sense their first album, which they titled simply The Music of Heat Miser. Elliot hated Mightier Than Thou. Excuse me. Elliot hated Mightier Than You, Pete Krebs recalls. It was catchy and bouncy and all, but he thought the lyrics were really dumb. The brand compositions were anomalies. Really, the band was Elliot's and Neil's. They were the dominant voices. They churned out the raw material, the subjects, the tone, the group aesthetic. And as always, from Texas to Lincoln, seemingly from infancy, Elliot wrote a ton of songs, Gust recalled. He was so prolific, effortless. His process was advancing much quicker than any songwriting around him. As Mitchell saw it, Elliot's moods had the most profound impact on the band by far. We followed his lead, Gust adds. He was a great craftsman. I learned how to write songs from him. And it was rarely easy, Neil's process, a lot less effortless. According to Mitchell... He was working really hard to keep up to contribute 50% of the songwriting to maintain an equilibrium in the band. There was no feeling of tension, nor resentment, nor competition. Since the Texas days, no one felt equipped to compete with Elliot musically. It was more about balance and equity. Plus, from its inception, the band was a joint effort with Lash and Peterson, although very gifted musically and trained at Berkeley and Oberlin, playing essentially subsidiary roles. Peterson, by nature, was pricklier about it. He didn't automatically defer. They always had ideas for bass lines, he says, but I wasn't going to listen, necessarily. I had my own ideas, too. Still, even to Peterson, it was clear that Elliot's writing process was exploding. He was phenomenally creative. The more street practices ended when Elliot and Neil found a larger house on Southeast 16th, just south of Division, where they lived with two female roommates and met as a band in the basement. At this critical juncture, a new force entered the equation, a small, beneficent tornado from the East Coast named J.J. Gonson. In no time, Gonson would transform the future of Heat Miser, and more important, Elliot's own life in music. <clears throat> Just as Pete Krebs and Elliot shared aspects of life history that served to strengthen their bond, that wordlessly drew them closer together, so did Elliot and J.J. The day after Gonson graduated from high school, she found herself locked up. I was a junkie, a garbage head, she says. Heroin, the one drug she managed somehow to avoid, although it always loomed tantalizingly. She lived with prostitutes. She lived with prostitutes. I was on the edge, but I did not whore, and sold acid to skinheads, a batch of which accidentally ran through the washer. 
Skinheads were looking for her. They weren't happy about the buy. Her mother flew her to Eden Prairie, Minnesota, for a seven-week treatment program. On the plane, the first thing Gonson did was order a drink. Her mother canceled it. I got clean, she says. I was actually 18, so I could have legally signed myself out, but I knew I was in trouble and I couldn't stop. I believed I had a disease. Addiction came easily. In the lockup, she learned to blow smoke rings. She also got turned on to the replacements and punk outfits like Big Black from Chicago. Inpatient time over, Gonson took a degree from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, that turned out to be useless. Her plan was to teach darkroom photography in either elementary or high school classrooms, but a recent measure annihilated art in public education. They took their red marker and basically crossed it out, she recalls. But a better fate came calling. Gonson had latched on emotionally and personally to a number of sub-pop bands, whom she photographed for fanzines like Rip, Cream, Spin, Triple X, and Suburban Noise. She even shot Nirvana when they played shows for crowds of 15 or so at MIT frat parties. Band members took to sleeping on her floor when they came through town. She cooked their meals, made sure they were taken care of. Her life was spent in clubs, shooting away a kind of punk Ouija. Inevitably, at one point she joined a band herself called Feeding Frenzy. Pause. Media G Tau. Why are you stuttering? Why are you nervous? You know, folks, at some point you'll like trip on a word and it will linger in your consciousness. You know, and you'll be reading, but you'll still be upset about some word that maybe you mispronounced four paragraphs ago. And so it just makes you sound like a bumbling, stumbling idiot. Until you can just slow the fuck down. And remember how to read a fucking book. Still, Gonson felt at loose ends, unsure where the ideal future lay. I went walkabout a little bit, she says. I ended up driving across the country, with no special destination in mind. Back in Boston, she'd met quite a few Northwest bands... And in one of life's random good luck, bad luck throwdowns, her car conveniently gave out in Portland, where she stayed with the Hell Cows and landed a job at La Patisserie, the same place Jason Mitchell worked as a waiter. Mitchell quickly became her closest friend, as he seemed to do with everyone he came in contact with, and he introduced Gonson to Neil and Elliot almost immediately. Heatmiser was not playing live yet. They were honing their craft recording sporadically in the fashion Elliot and Tony Lash had by now perfected. Yeah, listeners, you'll notice I haven't really done a whole lot of commentary. Um, I just, this is kind of educational for me. For example, I didn't know. I mean, I've read this book before. It's been about five years. But I must have completely forgotten about this J.J. Gonson woman. So anyway, yeah, I mean, I am not going to interject commentary if that's unnatural. Even before heading west, Gonson had done some band managing, mostly by necessity. She dated Sluggo, one of the members of Hullabaloo, and because the band was clueless when it came to bookings and other necessary evils such as putting together press releases, Gonson assumed that Gonson assumed that role for them, even going out on tour and working as a merch girl, selling t-shirts, etc. I've always been somebody who decides they want to do something then learns how, says Gonson. There had even been earlier a stint as a self-taught electrician for a circus. By trial and error, then, she learned band management, gradually accumulating a notebook full of names of pretty much all the important promoters in the country. Firsthand, she also got intimately acquainted with venues. She knew which were solid and which sucked. So when Jason Mitchell took Gonson to see Heatmiser at what was one of their virginal performances at the X-Ray between 2nd and 3rd and Burnside downtown, it's no longer there, she was no average spectator. She'd been around the block more than once. 
She knew music, she knew bands, and she knew what it meant to sell and promote. Heat Miser wasn't like anything else, Gonson recalls thinking. It was so much better, just mesmerizing, phenomenal music. So organic, they were just channeling these songs. I know when I hear good music. I realized it when I first heard Elliot's voice. In a shot by Gonson of a slightly later X-ray show, from May 1992, Elliot wears a Red Sox baseball cap, hoop earrings in both ears, and a cartoon t-shirt. Peterson stands to his right in a Madonna t-shirt and thick, black-rimmed geek glasses, cigarette eternally listing from his lips as slender, blonde Neil Gust sings. Behind them, seemingly tossed against brick walls, hang assorted velvet paintings of dogs and celebrities, such as Hulk Hogan, positioned at haphazard angles. Swaffer's response to the music was just like J.J.'s. For him, the sound was raw, aggressive, and crushing. Later, when he came to know the band members personally, he was struck by something else just as unusual. Heatmiser had manners. They understood a little about tact. They could be adult men. They were real people, not dumb kids. Properly reared. A smart band. Smart individuals. Hazel's J. Hell 7-inch had been so thrillingly successful, sales driven hard by a massive high school and college following, that the obvious question, a semi-urgent one, was what Cavity Search might bring out next. Hazel and Heatmiser played together almost once per month. There was an October 30th, 1992 show at Satyricon, including Trailer Queen and Pond, a show on November 11th at Belmont's, and several more in 1993 at La Luna and Clinton Street. Cooper and Swafford made up their minds swiftly. Somehow, no matter what it took, CSR2 was going to be Heat Miser. Uh, just interjection. CSR2, is go- uh, that's the Cavity Search release, their second release. It's going to be Heat Miser. A summit was arranged in the Division House basement. By this time, Cooper and Swafford knew the material exceptionally well. They'd, be- they'd been hearing it live for months. The band ran through several songs they figured might have vinyl potential, and instantly Swafford had his A-side, a decision he'd really made beforehand. The song was Elliot's Stray. Next was the matter of the B-side, and here things got dicier. Completely naively, Swafford suggested another Elliot number. Instantly, he picked up on the band's reluctance. They were dual singer-songwriters, after all, a hypothetical 50-50 split, Neil and Elliot. For a moment, no one knew what to say. The minor faux pas lingered. Then Elliot spoke up. Tactfully, sensitively, but also with obvious force, he simply declared, no. The other song would be Neil's. The suggestion was made deftly, belying its implications. Elliot emphasized how he liked Neil's song more than any of the other possibilities, and that was that. Swafford came away impressed. He acceded, naturally, to Elliot's wishes. The B-side would be, can't be touched. And the deal was struck. But the episode underscored what was, for most observers, for most observers, an open secret. This was Elliot's band. To Swafford, there was ongoing tension from the very beginning. Elliot didn't enjoy leading the charge, but his talents threw him into that role. It was inescapable. Still, his choice was to share the glory, at least for now. Okay, well, finally, Media Gita might have something to say. And I really don't have much to say here, but we're, we see the split. You know, this begins as a kind of uh, democratic, you know, 50-50 songwriting um, split between Elliot Smith and Neil Gust. And it's just, it's, it's a tough reality. And if you want to see the true tough reality of this, you need to watch, again, I'll probably mention it in most of these episodes um, on this playlist. Most of these videos about Elliot Smith I will mention. I always want to call it Heavier Than Heaven, but it's Heaven Adores You. And this is a documentary about Elliot Smith in which Heat Miser bandmates and Portland musicians and other people basically say, like, this guy was crushing everyone talent-wise. And we'll see that in the following pages. But how uncomfortable, how awkward when you're in a band with a genius. His songs are way better than yours. And okay, stop me, Gito. Genius, you already talked about this word genius on previous videos. 
Um, basically, I said you can't really be a genius in art because genius needs parameters. I don't know. If you want to hear that, just listen to the last Elliot Smith video. But you're in a band with this incredibly talented guy whose songs are way better than yours, yet you're supposed to be 50% in the songwriting. Uh, it's becoming very clear that's not going to happen. We have this uncomfortable moment. That would be the first harbinger of the total split, the disparity in talent between Gust and Smith. The record's black and white cover shows a group of suited men in gas masks, the backside reproducing a bomb incident plan, including 14 tips such as designate a chain of command. Production is attributed to Heat Miser, engineering to Tony Lash. Mixing occurred at Dead Aunt Thelma's. The vinyl itself is white with a blue center label. And band contact, the person to reach for bookings, press, and other matters, is J.J. Gonson. Prior to this moment, Gonson has spent three months in Europe looking at religious iconography, contemplating a project of an anthropological nature. For a time, she figured on staying out of band management altogether, but when she returned to Portland, Heatmiser sort of proposed. She asked them what they wanted exactly, what they had in mind, what their goals were. To make a living, they all replied. A path, in other words, out of dead-end, dispiriting jobs like framing or scraping paint off ceilings or making copies at Kinko's. So that's what we set out to do, Gonson says. Try figuring a way to get them free out of their shit jobs, how to make money as a band. A self-described obsessive worker, Gonson, once firmly committed, worked her ass off for the band. She was tireless and utterly dedicated. She had the contact, she had a wealth of experience, and she made effective use of both. The inaugural gig, which Gonson missed, was actually Valentine's Day 1992 at the X-Ray. Heatmiser opened for Nervous Christians, fronted by Dan Eklov, Gus' co-worker at TIS, a digital printing and graphics resource. From there, they played almost every weekend, still practicing twice per week. They got, over time, incredibly fast and tight, Peterson recalls. Shows were never poorly attended, always packed, with growing and avid followers. Although The Rocket characterized Heat Miser's songs as personal rather than political, and Elliot himself suggested Neil's numbers in particular don't carry political diatribes that would be better off in a speech, the political still got strangely personal in the early 1990s, thanks to the efforts of Mabon's Oregon Citizens Alliance. <clears throat> First, there was Measure 8 the group's only statewide victory. It repealed an executive order banning discrimination based on sexual orientation. The measure passed 53 to 47. It was later overturned. Uh, okay, no, skipping all this, skipping all this. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, and you could argue, listeners, that some of the stuff, no, I, I wouldn't have skipped, guys. I wouldn't have skipped most of the stuff, the band background here. Okay? I actually find it kind of boring. Um, I do. It's again, it's, it's hearing about someone being born in 1963 in Cincinnati, whose parents shut the fuck up and get to where he got his first blowjob and smoked a joint, please, for God's sakes. I don't care. Everyone's, it's all the same. Your mom did a thing. Your dad went out to the office, came home, beat the shit out of you, had six beers. You know, it's all the fucking same. It doesn't matter. Sure, you can get some insight into how an Elliot Smith became a musician. And, but, you know, that's why I jumped in kind of um, a third of the way into this book because I don't want all that background bullshit. It's boring. Now, here they're going on to talk about Measure 8 and Oregon laws, etc. And I think the point of this paragraph is that Portland during this time is becoming uh, more accepting of homosexuals. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so Neil Gust is gay, and he's coming out, is, is part of the point of that paragraph. So I'll read some of it. Um, Jason Mitchell remembers attitudes being somewhat more subdued, but Gust especially was very out, although not more than he was comfortable being. For Neil, Peterson says, it was like, I'm going to be in Portland, and I'm going to be out. His sexuality was an important part of his identity. It was also, in the lyrical content, an important part of Heatmiser. 
These Portland bands consisted of unusually well-educated, smart, thoughtful 20-somethings from colleges like Reed, Oberlin, Hampshire, the Berkeley School, steeped in gender politics, keenly attuned to the superstructural ideological dynamics of sexism, homophobia, patriarchy. For Eliot, as noted, such cultural critiques could become paralyzingly shame-inducing. In Hazel, there were intermittent clashes between Krebs and Belial, the latter a genius, according to Gonson, adept at fomenting, jarring but helpful chaos that fueled songwriting and performances, a sort of deliberate shit-stirrer. Once she refused to record Krebs' songs unless he changed their pronouns. Krebs found the idea absurd, but he understood its meaning. Says Brant Peterson, I saw Heat Miser as a band, not on a mission to be a queer band, but more attuned to the complexities of trying to make relationships of any kind work in your 20s without homo-specific or hetero-specific baggage. We all shared a sense of gender politics. Although really, it would be just as accurate technically to call Heatmiser a gay band as it would be to call it a heterosexual band. Any of us would have been happy keeping the ambiguity of whether we were gay or straight intact. Okay, well, you know I'm not going to let all that shit slide. I mean, I don't know how much I have to say about it, but essentially, all these band members in Heatmiser are coming from these, you know, as they mentioned, uh, liberal arts colleges which is certainly going to... And you have to remember, though, in the early 90s, there still was a lot of disdain for the homosexual community. There was discomfort. AIDS, HIV AIDS, had only been known about for less than 10 years at that point. So there was fear. There was hatred. So while I do not agree with feminism, etc., of course, during certain times, uh, being more accepting of homosexual... uh, Yeah, of gay people was completely necessary now we see that this band is political you know there's it's not just about accepting gay people for heat miser though so they they're saying they can be a straight band we can be a queer band you know neil gust is gay but how much does elliot want to be in a queer band you know these are questions um maybe schultz will address here i don't know now when we go on to look at elliot smith's music it largely avoids sexuality and you know and if he wants to, he sings about women that he likes, etc. Elliot probably wasn't going to be able to do that in Heat Miser. There's so many reasons that he had to leave. And, you know, this fucking political pot is just another one. Yet Elliot was highly complicit in it. You know, you have to remember that he is brainwashed in the same way that all of his band members are. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just... So while I... You know, it's 25 years later, you guys. Now, we're talking about a time period, 1992, where discussions of gender, homosexuality, gender politics are um, new. They're new in a way that they weren't in the 70s or 80s, okay? They are new and exciting, and people are feeling like they can be themselves. So when when I come, you know, my perspective is 25 years later, where it's when being a white man is a bad thing, being straight is a bad thing. Um, you know, whatever. That's that's more for Nick DiPaolo to talk about or Owen Benjamin or whatever. I don't particularly care about that shit, which is why I'm talking to you about music. You know, it's why every video typically has a subject besides, hey, what happened in the news and let's get mad about it. That's not what I do here. All this to say there was some legitimacy um, in what Heatmiser was trying to do on a social level in the early 90s. And there was ambiguity. Early reviewers pegged the band as a cliched, loud, macho outfit obsessed with chicks. The misunderstanding chafed. I guess they listened close, Elliot joked. Gust noted how the pronoun she was virtually Gust noted how the pronoun she was virtually absent from the tunes. The idea then that his songs focused on girls was preposterous. Lyric sheets were created to counteract possible confusion. Now it was clear boys were the subject, and the band, predictably, got labeled queer core or homo core. As he always did when he felt friends were being bullied or targeted for mindless abuse, Elliot stuck up for his bandmates. He wasn't down with any kind of victimization. He knew how it felt. Hopefully it'll come up more, he said of the subject. And we're all gay in the band if someone's going to be homophobic. 
Gust added, Most magazines tiptoe around the subject, even though I tell everyone in interviews I'm gay. It's all over the records. There were moments when the issue was more than theoretical. At one show outside Portland, fag this and fag that comments could be heard as the band took the stage. We were just nauseated, Peterson recalls. Krogan's Cracker Bash took on the OCA explicitly, writing, A Song for Lon Mabon. Apparently, according to press, Gus Can't Be Touched, the B-side for CSR2, also was OCA-inspired. I feel like a criminal, Gus writes. Don't crush me. He asks, Will you judge me? Then declares, I thought I couldn't be touched until they tagged me out. Oh, yeah, the OCA, the Oregon, gosh dang it, Citizens Alliance. All right, there we go. So, again, that illuminates my, I mean, can you imagine in Portland in 2018, um, people in the crowd maliciously calling the band members fags? Socially, it would never, ever happen. But one must remember that in 1992, this kind of homophobia was, I don't, I'm not going to say rampant, um, but it was certainly out there. Now these guys, Heat Miser, I guess they could have just avoided the entire subject, but they made a big show of being queer inclusive and this and that. So in a way, they brought it on themselves, sure. Uh, but who cares? They were trying to be themselves. They wanted to be free. Neil Gust wanted to write songs about boys because that's who he was attracted to. Okay, now you sound like a fucking liberal white knight, Media Gito. Uh No, 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 no. But as much as I dislike... Feminism, for example, one must remember that all these things are essentially rooted in what the group views as some kind of necessary social change. I don't think any of you would argue that we should be, you know, out there physically abusing gay people. Um, And those gay people had to earn those rights. They had to protest. Okay. In Stranger Than Fiction, a large number of songs tracked political angles, offering up various social critiques. In Heat Miser, as Elliot once po- uh, as Elliot once put it, the personal was political, the message there but refracted. Neil, he explained, writes about life like me, like anybody. He just happens to be gay. Whether he tired of explicitness or simply grew more internally preoccupied over time, Elliot's later, more realized work dropped politics altogether save for a very occasional and, one senses, reluctant forays into political themes, as in a distorted reality is now a necessity to be free, where he wonders why his country don't give a fuck. A line he arrived at only after thinking over several apolitical alternatives. Whether he tired of explicitness or simply grew more internally preoccupied over time, Elliot's later, more realized work dropped politics altogether. Okay. Yeah, that's, you know, he did not want to to be in a political band. Elliot Smith was all about the personal, but his lyrics were so dual. They were so loaded that they could have been like this, like what I want this show to be. It could have been about you, me, life. And not vague to a... Elliot Smith didn't write lyrics like, you know, when it ain't gonna go, nothing gonna go. He didn't write vague things that didn't make sense, you guys. Okay? And I'm not going to disparage his artwork by sitting here and quoting his lines to you. Listen to the music. Undaunted and definitely undeterred, In fact, enjoying the pseudo-controversy more than they like to admit, the band played on as the OCA retooled, turning its warped attentions to county and municipal politics, where it passed two dozen local initiatives before the Oregon Legislative Assembly authored a bill prohibiting governments from even considering LGBT rights measures, stripping all prior ordinances of lawful force. Anti-gay attitudes did not die, but... Maybon and his OCA grew less strident, slowly degrading, excuse me, slowly degrading into irrelevance. Meanwhile, Cavity Search kept releasing Heat Miser 7 Inches, for instance, 1993's Sleeping Pill and Temper, 
CSR 7 on blue vinyl, with a sleeve designed by Neil Gust and photos by J.J. Gonson, mixed by Tony Lash. Momentum was building, and ambitions rose beyond the hoped-for escape from crappy day jobs. There was a feeling that something big could be happening. Other feelings were taking off too, suppressed at first, but finally openly acknowledged. Elliot and J.J. were falling in love. Ooh, baby. You know what they say, ladies and gentlemen? Always leave them wanting more. You want more. You want to hear about this burgeoning romance between Elliot Smith and J.J. Gonson, one of several girlfriends that Smith would have over the course of his musical career. Um, so we've done it. This was kind of a uh, background building episode, as well as I, you know, as well as me imploring you to never forget. So now we're really going to be getting into the good stuff. This has been video three, episode three, of Media Gita reading Torment Saint, a life, the life of Elliot Smith by William Todd Schultz. So, if you like this video then like this video, subscribe to the channel, and also hit the little bell icon. So I want to thank you guys for listening and just say it feels good to be back. I am not doing as many videos because, frankly, I don't get that many views. I have other things that I could do uh, that either fulfill me a little bit more. It's very mutual. So if you want to help me out, then tell your friends. I know you don't, hey, man, you should check out this YouTube channel. I, tell your friends. You're not going to do that. Be creative. Share it. Share a link. You know, um, if I get 30 views on a video, uh, my grandma's cat gets that when she farts. You know, there's no fucking point in it. <laughs> but that said, you know, ultimately I should be doing it for myself. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't know. If I got, listen, I was thinking about this. If I got 1,000 views, uh, like the day after I released a video, yeah, that'd be worth it to me. Absolutely. You got 1,000 people you're talking to. You know, you get all these likes. It feels great, you guys. It feels great. But for now, I guess I just have to do it for you and me. So this has been Media Gito saying thanks for listening and have a nice day.